Good. Okay. I can... I can start now. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our um, our first OER panel for this week. Um, my name is Linda Kobashigawa. I'm a librarian um, here at FCC. Um, so I'll give, I'm going to give you a quick introduction and then um, send it over to Sally. And then Sally is going to um, talk a little bit more about open educational resources and zero cost resources. And then we're going to um, give it over to our panelists. Um, who have agreed to join us today. So um, this is really exciting uh, because I am the, um, I'm taking over Sally's um, previous role as um, the FCC liaison for the um, California Community College's Academic Senate um, for their open education initiative. So um, I'm taking over the local role while Sally is now the regional um, representative for, for the region. Um, so this is my first like official OER event. So it's, it's really exciting for me. Um, and I'm still learning a lot. Um, but so the background um, for um, this this week is actually open education week. So it's a broader um, focus, but open education is really um, grounded in open educational resources. And um, it started in 2012, which is longer than than I knew. Um, but it's basically um, just an opportunity to share and learn more about open education. So Sally came up with this really great idea of having our faculty here locally share um, the resources that they've been using, whether it's OER, um, zero cost, um, and really you know breaking incorporating those. Um, resources into their courses and breaking down those cost barriers for students, um, which is really the you know the the overall goal of open education so um uh so with that i'll i'll hand it over to sally and uh, um i think i should thank susie nitzel too for helping us out with planning these um these panels as well so go ahead sally okay thank you linda and i am just really excited to have linda helping out because what yeah we definitely can use librarian help very very excited about that okay so let me um just really quickly uh, i would like to uh show you a couple of slides just really, really quickly to just kind of, just so that you know what you're looking at when we're going through uh, the different panelists' um, uh, presentations and their materials. Okay, so OER, this is the first uh, acronym that I'll introduce you to. You probably have heard this a lot, and I do want to tell you what this is because it's used kind of, um, overly used and um, uh, people use it to mean just kind of anything that's free, anything that's out there, and it's, that's not exactly what it means. So OER is really talking about the license. It doesn't really have to do with the cost, although most of the time, especially when we're talking about digital sources, these are free sources. But there are many, many textbooks that you can um, have your students purchase that are actual, you know, physical textbooks that do have a cost associated with them. And that cost would be, you know, paper, ink, printing, those kind of things. Um, full textbooks or smaller, you know, small packets or smaller textbooks, um, you know, all of that as long as the license is um, open, okay? Um, <laughs> OER also includes not only textbooks, but it includes any kind of materials. So when, especially when you're looking at Canvas Commons, which a lot of us are used to looking at, you're gonna see that there are modules, quizzes, videos, all of that is, you know, anything that you can use in your class, anything that you put on in, in Canvas that's open, that's openly licensed, that's included in OER. Okay. The licenses. Now, this is one thing that uh, instructors are often a little, uh, have a little bit of anxiety about when they come across the licensing. And I just want to reassure you and let you know that while at, at first glance, it seems a little confusing, but really it, you know, it's just kind of, um, these basics are, Whatever source you're using, it's important to just 
know what the license is and basically just copy and paste it, okay? You really only have to get into the finer details of licensing if you are going to um, write your own OER material or if you're going to you know, take a couple of different lice, uh, licensed um, sources that have different licenses and then mix them and, and recreate something. But if you're just going to take something and use it in your class, it's just a matter of copying and paste. So uh, the first one that you often see is this um, CC BY. And that just means that you have to put the author's name. The author just wants you to, when you use it, they just want you to acknowledge that they, um, you know, that they're associated with it. And that could be the person or the association or the, um, you know, uh, whatever, whoever made the resource. The second one that's really common is the CC by SA. And that just means that along with the author's name, you also have to keep the same license. So for example, you couldn't take something and then change it to a more restrictive license, for example. You have to keep the, the licensing the same. And you know, the idea here is that it, it's, it's kind of just this, the same thing as, you know, if you imagine you're in your department and maybe you made like a great handout or something um, for your, you know, your intro class, and you know it's something that other instructors in your department might use and you just kind of send it out in an email you send out the word document and you say hey look what i made i you know i spent a lot of time on this i'm proud of it and i thought you might use it too then you give them permission to do whatever they want with it kind of change it maybe change it for their class alter it a little bit use it you know maybe post it in their canvas class this is the same thing that these authors are doing except on a larger scale and they don't know you so they are um, giving permission for anyone to do that and the authors that have chosen to put these licenses on their works are very generous and they don't, they're not trying to bust you, okay? So, so even if you mess this up or even if you do this a little bit wrong or you make a mistake here, um, I really uh, don't want you to feel like, you know, there's some kind of uh, like a attribution police that's going to come, you know, um, at you and, you know, and bust you and, and, and get you in trouble. You know, the, the, the biggest thing that will happen is someone will say, hey, you know, just copy and paste and put that on, on the page and then you're good to go. Um, like I said, most of the time when you see um, your material, it's just a matter of copying and pasting. And a lot of the platforms now, when you, especially uh, if you're using Canvas Commons, for example, when you pull it into your Canvas class, or you make a copy of it, it just, auto the, the license just automatically comes over. You don't even have to do anything. It's just right there. But they do also have these attribution builders and they're very similar to like um, an MLA or an APA um, citation generator where, you, and many colleges have these, they're free online. You just add the information, you know, choose the, you know, the author's name, you type that in, you choose what kind of license you want, and then you click a button and then it creates it for you. And you can see down here on the bottom, I don't know if you can see my a uh, little cursor, but this is one that was created by um, this attribution builder. So it looks real professional, but again, it has the hyperlinks, but again, you don't have to be this fancy. It's just a matter of putting the information that they want you to put on. That's it. Just giving credit to your sources. Okay. One more um, uh, acronym that I want to introduce you to, and that is ZTC. So this has to do with the actual cost of the materials that we're requiring our students to purchase. So remember, OER has to do with the open license, and usually they're free, especially when it's in a digital format, but not always. ZTC is means it's free, okay? So these are materials that, you know, and, and sometimes OER and ZTC are the same thing, but not always. So for example, there are many, many free resources that, that our students have access to, that we have access to, that we can give them that 
are, you know, really, really valuable and really um, great to use. And one that I have used a lot. So I teach um, um, ESL and linguistics. And in linguistics, there really is no in good intro um, uh, OER textbook. What we have done, and I'll, sh for those of you who come tomorrow, I'll show you my, my course tomorrow, but um, what we have done is really take a lot of these free sources and just kind of put them together in our Canvas classes. And so um, we've taken library sources, um, sources from the internet that are free. They have, you know, they may have ads on them, but we're free to use them. Um, and then the last one is writing your own. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you sit down and write, you know, a three to 400 page textbook, although of course you could if you wanted to, but that is just, you know, anytime, especially when we're, when we're transitioning to the online delivery, anytime you make a video, you put, make a welcome message, you put, you know, instructions, you type anything out, that is you, you know, maybe you're typing out what you would say in your lecture, um, that is you writing basically a free source for your students, information for your students. So think about that as you're looking um, and, and you are um, watching these great instructors as they're sharing their materials because they're using a, a combination of all of these to not only give their students um, uh, uh, sometimes free resources, but also lower cost resources and just a, a great combination of these things, okay? There are some disciplines where you can you know, just grab like an OpenStax textbook and the, th the whole thing is right there and it's perfect and you can just, you know, use that whole cloth in your class, but there are some disciplines that where that doesn't exist and you have to kind of uh, piece it together a little bit. So just think about that. Okay, one last thing and then I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Um, as we're going through and looking at the different um, sources, um, or and the, the different things that the instructors are, are showing you. Think about the criteria that you use to choose your current textbook, okay? Um, what did you use? How did you come across, um, you know, this text? I'm assuming that everyone here is teaching at least one course where they're using a commercial textbook you know, how did you end up using that textbook? I know for me, um, in linguistics, there's basically three textbooks that we generally use for the intro class. One is just kind of like a too simple, doesn't have good examples. It's kind of boring and dumb. You have to supplement the hell out of it. And then another one is uh, like too complicated. Um, and so you have to almost teach only like the first half of each chapter. The second half is more for like uh, undergraduate level, um, you know, high, higher level courses. So there's a lot that we have to leave out. So the one that I chose was honestly like the least worst one. And then over the years, I just used it and then I just developed my assignments around it and my quizzes around it. And it wasn't that I really liked it, but it just, I just was using it. And so getting to the point where I could unuse it and get away from it was some work, okay? So think about that. And then do you know how much that textbook costs? Um, if you don't, look it up, you might be surprised. And just think in your head, you know, if you could snap your fingers, you know, and just say there's no work involved in on your part, but if you could just imagine the perfect textbook, you know, what would it look like and how would it change your class? How would it affect you the way that you teach? How would it affect your students? Just kind of imagine a perfect world, okay? Okay, so um, that's all that I wanna say to you today. I will be sticking around uh, after. I'll be looking at the chat. I see there's some action there. And uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, uh, type your questions for me in the chat. Afterwards, I'll be sticking around so we can talk a little bit more. If you have a, a specific need, you're looking for something for a specific class or a discipline, do um, ask me either today or you can send an email and we will, uh, Linda and I will uh, uh, for sure uh, be on the hunt for you. Okay, so uh, Nick, are you ready? Go for it. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to make sure you guys can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, 
so I think in, in general, I was um, open to the idea about uh, open data just in, as a concept generally. So the leap from this idea of open data, say in technology to using OER wasn't too great for me because I was already sort of interested in this area. Um, but I, I started to sort of investigate OER texts at a um, <clears throat> school that I was teaching down south uh, because at, at that time, the department chair, <clears throat> when I was first hired there said, um, <clears throat> the department uses the same textbook, everybody uses the same textbook. And I was able to sort of use something that I wanted to use, uh, but we encourage you to use this same textbook that everybody else is using. So immediately it was sort of strange because I'd never taught somewhere where the entire department uses the same textbook. So as I started talking to more people, uh, it turned out that the, um, the publisher would, uh, for every new textbook that was sold, the publisher would donate some money to our scholarship fund, the political science scholarship fund. So they were, you know, sort of pushing new textbooks on students, which again, I thought was very strange. At some point, the students became savvy to it and uh, they were, they began, right, they were kickbacks. They, you know, they, students know where to find textbooks for cheaper. And I started to encourage them to do so. Um, and, and then, you know, the faculty started to see this drop off in their um, scholarship fund. So, um, you know, I, I pushed back against this. I had a colleague that was teaching sociology that was using an, an OER textbook. And he said, you should really um, look into this. They have an American government option. So um, I was just sort of curious about my, the students in my class. So I, I did a survey of the three or 400 students I had at the, for that semester and said, how many of you are buying new? How many are buying used? How many are renting? Uh, renting new, renting used? How many are going digital, like an e-text? And the, the, the overall number of students, like 65% would rent a used physical copy. And then you had a, you know, a number of students that would rent a, uh, like an e-book. But the majority, the, you know, the vast majority of the students would rent a used copy. So that was depending on where they got the used copy between 40 and 60 bucks. So I took this survey, which I asked the other folks in my department to launch the survey as well, whether they did or didn't, I have no idea. But um, I took what I had gathered from my students to the a department meeting and said, this is what the students are doing. So they're not buying a new text for the most part to begin with. So why, why do we continue to, to do this, to push these new textbooks? And then I told them 40 to 60 bucks to rent a used physical copy. And the chair of my department at the time said, 40 bucks, I don't see what the big deal is. It's 40 bucks, then moved on to a, 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 another conversation. So OER wasn't even discussed uh, at the time. So I went back to my students and said, guess what the chair of my department said? about a $40 textbook. And the students were, um, I mean, obviously upset because one student said 40 bucks is how I get to campus every week. That's gas to get to campus. 40 bucks is a big deal. So we, we started this discussion about OER and, and um, the students were familiar with it. And because it, it exists, this open data exists all over the place that again, students are informed about. They understand what open data is. And uh, so it's just a, an extension of what they already know. They're already familiar with the idea behind open data in this way. So um, ultimately when I made the decision to use OER, and I've done this now for a few years, uh, there were a few reasons why I chose it. Number one, it's an equity issue. We, we know this to be true. The cost of textbooks is um, for a lot of students, can be prohibitive, right, to getting into uh, school. And, and, and there are a number of studies out there about how in some cases, um, certain groups of students just would rather not sign up for classes because of the fear of being able to pay for these um, textbooks. And, and I think generally textbook costs have um, 
sort of been dis- decreasing over the years, but it's still substantial in, in part because of the fact that more and more faculty members are using OER. But um, in, in terms of the equity issue, if we could um, eliminate that aspect, that barrier to education, why shouldn't we? I mean, it, it seems like it's a no brainer. If this is one of the reasons or the reasons why students don't show up to class, then let's just eliminate that altogether. And even if students are using uh, financial aid to to buy the textbooks, as I'm sure many of you have are, are aware of, students may not get that financial aid until later in the semester. So I've had students say, "When do I need the book?" And it's like, "Well, the class started last week, so you need the book." And you know, it's like, "Well, I don't get my check for another two weeks or something." And then they're playing catch up, or they don't catch up at all. They they never catch up. So if you have that resource available to them, even before class starts, it's, it it makes sense. So the equity issue is, um, was really important for me. The other was about the content. So if I am teaching in my courses, 50% of the content of a textbook and the other 50% comes from like a ZTC or, you know, uh, outside sources like, <clears throat> journal articles or news articles that they that are free to them I've posted so they have access to it if I'm only using 50% of that textbook content but they're paying for 100% of that textbook it, again it didn't make sense to me and I know a lot of faculty members will say you know mine is 40 60 like most of this stuff comes from me like I'm the source of the information we're the experts quote unquote in these fields um, I don't rely on the textbook for 100% of my course content. Um, and so for me personally, having students pay for 100% of a textbook that I only use 50% of the content didn't make sense. Um, the, the third reason is that after I started using it and getting feedback from students, the students absolutely love having this as an option. It, again, in part because of, you know, it relieves some of the stress, some of the anxiety about um, paying for a textbook. And again, this semester, and we discussed this yesterday, I would get emails saying, I don't see the link, I don't see the textbook that's, um, you know, for your particular class through the um, bookstore. And, and it's like, well, guess what? Surprise, you know, you don't have, there is, it's free, you don't have to pay for it. And then there's just this sense of relief about one less thing that the students have to worry about, particularly with first generation students, particularly with, um, uh, you know, first semester students, regardless of whether or not their parents have gone to school, like just trying to figure all of it out. This is one less thing that they have to figure out. And I think, um, you know, sort of looking back on it now, the conversations I had about OER with faculty members in the past the concern was about um, the review process of the text. And I think there is an idea that these online textbooks, like the one I'm using is like, like some of us had in grad school. I know I had a, 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 one of my professors compile all of this information and have it bound, <clears throat> right? And then, and then here's your textbook, I just created it for you and then you pay I paid him the 30 bucks or 60 bucks because he paid for the photocopies. Like th- that's not the way it works anymore. These are, you know, these are um, peer reviewed. There are a, a dozen um, authors that are part of it that come from reputable universities. It's not just sort of thrown together by, you know, random people who don't know what they're talking about. And I think that is sort of the fear is that, well, What's the content like? Well, you can access it for free. I mean, you could go in and dig through the um, textbook to see what's in there. And, and when I finally landed on the text that I really liked, the content is not dissimilar. And in fact, they um, because it's able to be updated uh, faster, there's the content is more up to date than a, a new edition physical copy of a textbook that has to be uh, updated, you know, on an annual basis rather than on a monthly basis. Um, in addition, they have a lot of student resources, and again, all of it is free. You can you can um, sign up for these. You can register. The students can register, and they have access to all of these different student resources, like practice quizzes, like flashcards, 
They can highlight using their cursor on the textbook. I mean, it's all the stuff that they can, they have access to not only on a computer, but on their phones as well, which again, the sort of the feedback I get from students is I like, even if I don't have a computer, I have a smartphone where I can read my textbook while I'm waiting in line to do something. I mean, it's just in terms of, uh, uh, access. I mean, it's just uh, you can't you can't beat it. And and I tell the students from the beginning, if you want, if you want an actual physical textbook, there is the option. You just have to go through uh, the the company, and they'll print one out and send it to you. So, um, if you want, I can show you. I don't know if you want to see this. The it's a political science text, but let me. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay. So. This is the American Gov. This the the it's OpenStax is the um, who I went through, and uh, they have the the subjects here. But again, um, it's very simple to use. It's broken down by chapter. You click on it, and it gets you there, right? And then again, you can highlight. It'll ask you once you've registered if you want to highlight this stuff, and it'll it compile it into notes for you. And the student is able to do that. Uh, it has. Um, uh, test banks and, and PowerPoint presentations and all just as a normal um, supplementary website would for a physical textbook. So I was very happy with my decision um, and uh, I, I certainly will be using it in, in the future. And again, I supplement this textbook with other ZTC uh, sources as well. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm really happy with it. And that, that's all I have to share on my end. Hello, I'm next, I guess, and I'm Susana Sosa. I know some of you, I teach art history primarily in film studies. So I'm gonna talk about my experience. I'm gonna share my screen, uh, both some pros and cons that I've uh, felt. And I think I, I primarily have been using um, uh, op um, maybe not completely OER, but free resources. So let's see if I can get this going here. Um, and so <laughs> I've been I'm using these in my um, um, a variety of different ways in my classes. It really is a process, I think, of learning together with your students and how to best use them, what sources there are out there. And it is uh, does take time. Uh, so um, I've decided I teach a, a course each semester now in film history. And um, this is the course that I've gone completely textbook free in. Um, and um, I think, um, you know, again, I'll show you some uh, things that I use in that class. And I also use uh, OER um, um, supplements for my art history classes to enhance the digital textbooks. So I think it's important in the syllabus statement on my um, class, I, the, the film class, is to really emphasize, and I talk about this in my introduction, that you know, these, these readings are required, that they're not optional since we don't have a textbook. Um, and that is an issue for some students, um, you know, especially for a film class, they think it's all just about watching films. And so I, I need to keep stressing this throughout the semester, not just in the syllabus statement, but, you know, in, um, you know, remind them and uh, link assignments to the readings. I do have some recommended supplementary textbooks that I actually, um, when we were back in campus, would be on reserve at the book uh, at the library. Now there's um, other ways to get it. Um, for this film class, just as Nick was saying, um, you know, the issues that I had with it were not just about the price, which we are all dealing with. Um, but these are just, I thought, poor quality books in terms, I mean, they were printed on cheap paper. They didn't have, I'm an image person. Uh, they didn't have very good images. Uh, they weren't really user-friendly. User as Nick also, or as, um, as Sally said, you know, some of it was written too basic. Some of these were written too advanced and you had to spend a lot of time, um, you know, sort of filling in the gaps. Um, they didn't have a glossary. They weren't interactive. And um, um, so I've decided to sort of build my own content, not sort of, I have. Um, and the other problem I have with this is that the text didn't align with the course content. And so I'd be having students read part of one chapter and another chapter, and they sometimes were, you know, give me feedback about that. It says, oh, this is so easy. We're reading, you know, part of this chapter and this chapter. So um, on my Canvas site, I've now, um, you know, built these modules where I've uh, taken, been writing a lot of, of things. So that is, of course, the time-consuming aspect of it. There are some um, 
OER uh, resources that are in the Creative Commons, um, but I've just decided to fit my uh, teaching needs to do this. So I have, of course, the modules, which you're all familiar with, but for the film class especially, what I really um, like is that I'm able now to integrate film sequences within the text. Instead of having a students read the chat textbook and then say, you know, uh, while well, we're in class, you know, go online and we'll see these sequences in class. Now they can read along, they can replay them. Um, again, so, um, and um, I have a bibliography, I'm just showing you part of it. Um, and this seems to uh, work much better. I'm getting a better feedback on the discussion board posts I have and on writing assignments because the students can take the time um, to, you know, connect um, the um, information and the background, the history, the context with the films that we're seeing and the film sequences we're seeing. Um, in case some of you don't know, um, you know, there are some, um, I'm sure you all know that we have various uh, streaming video um, uh, databases on campus. So the one that I'm using primarily for this film class, because this is an issue too, when we were in class, uh, you know, uh, pop in a, a DVD and we watch the film together. I do miss that a lot because, you know, we can discuss it and you can see their reaction, you know, our collective reaction to certain films. Uh, that is that, um, that part of film viewing in general is something I'm, I'm, I'm just really missing. Uh, but the, the, the main database I'm using is something called Swank. So Swank is a curated database um, that Linda can tell you more about, but basically our campus has ability to, um, um, faculty have ability to request um, um, these um, films. They're uh, mostly from Hollywood. There are a few foreign films in it. And basically uh, you have, they have a catalog, you go through it. If they have it, you send a request to Linda and Linda will um, process your request, you have, you state, you know, how you're going to use it in class. And the processing is very quick. I had a film that I needed it. She got processed really quickly. The only drawback is that we only have a certain number of these uh, free streaming films for our entire campus. So I think it's a hundred. Is that correct, Linda, for the entire campus? So right now, I think there's like maybe 50 or 60 up here. It's I think it's primarily in, not on just film um, instructors use this. So there's some other databases. You can find films on demand. Um, and but my, one of my issues is a few films that I uh, used to show in class, they aren't available. <laughs> there's no free streaming. And I, I don't want to have students pay or subscribe to Netflix if they don't already. Uh, so I've had to change, um, you know, the content um, and my assignments because based on the film, it's especially difficult for me. This is a world cinema class. So having um, getting foreign language films, um, there's certain countries which I'm, I cannot find in Swank. So I've had to, um, um, you know, try to find other resources Sometimes you'll see <laughs> the things illegally posted on YouTube, but that is not always the best uh, source. Um, I'm going to go back to my film history class and show you some more on the Canvas site in a few minutes, but I also wanted to mention my art history classes. So one of the things that I've been um, trying to do in the time I've had, and I hope to do more of this this summer, is to explore those um, OER um, sites. There's Merlot is one of them, and you know there are, the Khan Academy is another great one. Uh, but um, I have done some exploring, and for my art history classes, I haven't quite found the, the completely free um, or um, OER content that I want. And um, a lot of it has to, uh, so I've decided to go with a digital textbook, which, you know, costs about $89 for students, and that's good for six months. But one of the other reasons in my art history class is that I've, I've, I've not fully gone completely textbook free. It has to do with images and copyrights and um, image quality. Um, so I have done some work on putting some images on, on uh, Canvas, but as you know, if you have to caption them, you have to get the right size, good enough for students to view, um, you know, they, they um, uh, label them all. It's very time consuming. So the, uh, the textbooks I use have these great, you know, um, digital images, they have zoom features, um, flashcards, digital image flashcards. Um, the textbook reads aloud to them, which helps for accessibility. I've done surveys, I've, I've worked with a couple different textbook uh, publishers, and we've done efficacy sur uh, surveys of our um, studies in my classes using these products. So I know, you know, what works for students. And the, the videos are embedded. So um, again, accessibility is one main reason, um, especially for the images. The also another um, issue is, of course, um, our um, 
ability to upload images in the space and storage limitations on Canvas. Um, in case you're um, um, concerned about that or have issues, you might want to attend um, some of the workshops that they've been having, the teach and learn workshops. I went to one a couple weeks ago now uh, with Carolyn DeAnda, and she talked about storage issues and some ways to get around that. But um, you know, doing that uh, takes a lot of storage. Uh, of course, the you know the fact that the quiz is already done is a great thing. But you know, eighty-eight dollars is still a burden for many students. Um, I have to con constantly sort of change the due dates at the beginning of the semester for students who can't afford to buy it uh, the, up with the assigned quizzes and material, although there's a two week free trial period. But the print version is $231. Our history textbooks are incredibly expensive, again, primarily due to the copyright issues and uh, with pr printing images. Um, so some challenges um, I faced, uh, again, I've, I've, I've had some um, good things about it, but aligning the readings that you can find to your lecture content um, and again, spending the time to find those materials. And um, one thing that I'm also keep tweaking every semester is how much reading do you give them <laughs> you know, online versus a textbook as these discrete chapters. And if you're pulling in multiple sources, um, you know, two, three articles, is that too much? Um, and uh, I've already mentioned the additional resources that some textbooks have, like glossaries, a vocabulary list, um, um, the images for me. Um, the other issue that I've had to deal with a lot is accessibility. And uh, this uh, was very frustrating for me last semester in this film history class, uh, because not only was it about the text, um, but it was about video and audio sources. I happened to have a blind student in my film history class, and she was completely blind. And um, I, you know, <laughs> we worked together, but we were both very frustrated because uh, she let me know before this, the class started that she was uh, um, uh, blind and um, she had, it wasn't a, she wasn't born uh, um, blind, but she, it happened in her adult or, you know, not too long ago. But uh, we contacted our DSPS. I asked for services because the issue was that her reader um, that was reading the screen text when it came to, if I had a table in it that made it difficult, um, I had to really learn how to use the formatting right to use headers um, and to really check things when she got to the video. And this is a film, uh, you know, class we're seeing lots of foreign films. Well, the software that she had access to was not, could not translate closed captions and the, the and the embedded, you know, um, translations of foreign language. So we spent, we, you know, talked to uh, DSBS. I think I went to a session with Linda um, uh, sorry, um, with some other people here. Um, and we just could not find anything that was free and accessible for her. She actually had to purchase a, a kind of software that would allow her to um, see the films. And um, I started on the short sequences to um, visually narrate, you know, some of the short sequences, but I simply didn't have time to do it for everything. So it was a very challenging situation. Um, and that we faced and that I've been, you know, in case it happens again, I really want to know um, some other kinds of resources that I can help students with accessibility. Uh, another issue that I've had um, with both, um, you know, using our OER for both classes is that, again, as I said earlier, is the quality of the content. So this is a page that I'm pulling up from uh, one of the, um, um, I think Merlot, you know, has this had this page saying, oh, here's um, a, a unit you can use on Paleolithic art, which I teach. So I thought, great. And you can see how it's, you know, uh, labeled here, visual arts. And the, the issue I have with this is that it's way, it, some of the resources I found are entirely too brief. They don't go into enough depth. And also you have to be, I have found that, you know, you have to be careful about who is the author of some of these sources? Now, there are many, you know, um, professors, um, instructors who are sharing their content for free, but this particular one, which again was in one of those databases saying, here's these free resources in, in Creative Commons. Uh, the author uh, here is, um, and also, you know, I, I really want to avoid any sites with commercials uh, ads on them, but the author here, um, you know, her education, she has a BA in illustration, and with art history minor. So she just doesn't have the, I think the, um, the credentials to write an in-depth, um, you know, kind of 
um, resource that I would use for my students. So again, it takes time to go through the sources and to really evaluate them. Um, so I just want to uh, share, but I'll, I'll come back to this slide, my ending slide, but I just, if I can um, stop the share and go to my Canvas site for a minute um, and show you again. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know if you're seeing my Canvas page now or not. Are you okay? So I just want to, you know, point out, so this is the kind of content that I create for my students. I um, mean, you know, this is me synthesizing various articles, writing them. Um, so uh, and in the, but the embedded videos are good and I can have glossary, but here's what happens every once in a while. If you don't keep checking, right? <laughs> the videos go down. Uh, they're not on YouTube anymore. This just happened. This was uh, this last week's um, um, module. So now I have to go. And, and sometimes the students don't tell you. <laughs> so I guess they just skip it. Uh, I was uh, reviewing some things like, okay, I have to find another one. I do have some software that allows me to capture um, my DVDs if I have them, but again, that takes time to render, it takes time to uh, put up, and it takes a lot of space. Um, but I, you know, I, I give them, um, the one thing I do like about having this kind of format is I can give them a clues on how to, you know, um, um, look at the images or look at the, the videos we're seeing to think, to, think, to, to think about these things. So let me now go back and finish up my last point here. Um, uh, sorry switching back and forth between these two formats. I'll stop sharing for a minute. And um, go. technology, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. So um, my goals uh, for improving um, um, and thinking about uh, using um, both free resources in OER is I still have students who they tell me they, they really prefer a book. Um, so luckily we have some uh, free eBooks, so I, I need to find some alternatives. And um, I also, as I said earlier, to make ensure the students are reading the, the resources to make sure that there's um, uh, the reflecting on the reading. So incorporate more of the reading content directly into either the lectures or, or referencing that content uh, into the lecture notes and into our class discussions. And um, that also would involve maybe creating short writing uh, questions that relate to the, the, the reading content. Uh, so that's one thing that I'm working on for doing for um, not just the film history class, but also my art history classes. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from the, the other uh, panelists and hearing any comments or questions that you might have. So, oops, I lost my stop share. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm up next. Hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Williams. I'm English faculty, and I am also the Title V Instructional Coordinator for Fresno City College. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as I talk a little bit about um, my use of OER and ZTC. Let me go ahead. All right, uh, can you see my Canvas shell right here? Yes, excellent. Um, so I actually want to start with this book here, um, Once Upon a Time, and I don't even remember why, but I was talking with a class about creation myths. And, um, you know, the students were, were very interested and we were looking up different things online and I just happened to come across this book. Um, it was uh, published by Bruce Railsback. He works for the University of Georgia and he had this little note down at the bottom that said, this book is not copyrighted by the author and may be freely reproduced um it's just so long as you don't try to charge money for it and I thought that's so awesome right like here someone took the time uh to put together this text and then just put it out there and said you know hey anyone can use this and if you see up at the top um this edition came out in 2000 and so I being very new to this um I wasn't 
sure. And so I actually reached out, I emailed him and I said, I would like to use your book in my class. Is that okay? And he responded and he said, yes, absolutely. Now, um, obviously based on what Sally mentioned earlier, if this had a Creative Commons licensing on it, I wouldn't even have had to ask. Um, but this was before I even knew about Creative Commons licensing. And the to me, what just blew me away was that someone had taken their time, their energy, their research, they had put it together and they had shared it as a resource for other instructors to use um, without wanting anything in return. And I thought that was so cool. Um, and so I actually do still use this text uh, to this day. Um, I also like that it's short. And so if I do have students that would like a printed version of it, we can do that very easily because it's only about 45 pages long. But I have graduated past this text and I am now really using OER in my different, um, my different courses. And um, I wanna go ahead and show you an OER textbook that I'm using for my English 1A course. So my class is zero cost. Um, I do have a mix of OER and then zero cost uh, resources in both of the courses that I'm currently teaching, uh, English 1A and Mythology. Those classes, um, either I'm using library resources, for example, in my, um, mythology class, uh, the students read the Iliad or the Odyssey. And so Linda gave me resources to eBooks through the library. Um, and the eBook is provided free. And if students really, really want a book, they can get, uh, they can actually purchase a, a copy of one of these books uh, for between um, five and $15. So the cost is still very low, but generally I would say 95% of my students choose to just stay with the ebook, uh, ebook version. And then in my English 1A class, for our course textbook, we are using a book called You Writing. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about my process for getting this book, um, because this is something that Sally Potter did for us in the English department. And I'm volunteering her because I know that she loves OER and she would be willing to do this for any discipline. But um, a lot of us were thinking about moving to OER, but we just weren't sure. Um, we just hadn't seen all the resources. And so what she did was she set up a petting zoo and she brought in, gosh, how many were there, Sally? 15, 20 different textbooks? Yeah, something like that. And, you know, the, the thing about English is that all of those resources exist for English. This is not necessarily the case for, for every, every discipline. So just, right. yeah, so temper your, um, you know, excitement <laughs> a little bit. Depending on which <laughs> discipline you're in. Um, but so she went out and she found these textbooks for us and we did a read around where we each kind of looked at different books. This was not the book that I was given to examine, but based on the summary and the feedback from my colleagues who had looked at this book, I decided I was going to give it a closer look and, um, I was really, really impressed with the text that they had put together, the topics that they had selected. Like both Sally and Nick mentioned previously, I have never met a textbook that I wanted to assign from beginning to end. Um, and so I would always have my students buy textbooks and I would attempt to assign as much as possible because they had put out that cost. But it didn't mean that I loved everything uh, or even the order that it was put together. I would often assign things out of order. And so switching to a completely free textbook um, makes me feel much more free to skip sections. If there's a part that's not relevant to what we're doing in class, I don't feel guilty at all about skipping over it. And if I can give it to individual students as a resource or extra help, then I will. But otherwise, no guilt whatsoever in terms of not using it because it, it didn't cost anything. Um, but one of the things that I love about this book that I selected is that each section ends with 
additional resources. And all of these resources are hyperlinked. So um, all students have to do is click and they can go and they can get additional resources on different topics um, that are not necessarily in the body of the text itself. And as someone who's, you know, teaching different English skills, not every student needs additional help with every single one of these skills. So to be able to take the textbook and then individualize it to my students and say like, hey, you seem to be struggling a little bit with, um, you know, the concept of ethos, you can check out this additional resource that's in the chapter, as opposed to having to assign that reading to everyone. Um, and so that's something that I have really, really enjoyed about this particular text. So I will say, if you do have an option, if you have multiple OER uh, texts that you are able to choose from in your discipline, folks that have gone the extra mile to include these kinds of additional resources, sometimes it takes the form of, of, of resources like this. Sometimes they've made quiz banks and you can download those quiz banks. You can put them in your Canvas shell. It just depends on the text and, and the content and, and the mode of teaching. Um, but I, I love that there can be so many additional resources attached to OER. And when we were talking about licensing earlier, when it is licensed in such a way that it says that you're allowed to remix the content, that means that you can both pull out parts without having to use the whole and it also means that you can create ancillary content. So you can create a quiz bank and then share it based on that textbook um, if, it has, if it has been licensed that you can remix the materials. So I do find that having an OER text is very helpful in the freedom that it gives me as an instructor and then also in the um, in the freedom that it gives students. I never have to worry anymore. As Susanna mentioned earlier, um, there was always that first two to three weeks of the semester when students didn't have their textbooks. And uh, a lot of them are waiting for their financial aid check to come in um, until they're able to make that purchase. Now I don't have to worry, right? I can assign a reading in week one or you know two without thinking about whether or not students are gonna have that reading because I've given a copy of the book to everyone. I've made it accessible to everyone in the class by using OER and ZTC resources. Um, I also, because it is English 1A, we do have to use a book length text. And um, I've taught a variety of different texts over the years, but one of the deciding factors for me was always how much that book costs. And there are a lot of, um, you know, pieces of classic literature that have been republished a million times and uh, publishers will try to get you to buy their edition because it has critical thinking questions or writing assignments or scholarly research um, related to that book that are embedded in the text. And the more of that they have, the more expensive the textbook gets, right? Um, whereas I know enough about the authors that I'm teaching that I can go out and find critical response to those texts that's available through our Fresno City College library website that doesn't cost students anything additional. And often these texts are also available for free through things like OpenStax, Project Gutenberg. Um, so, so I do now try to find a text that has, um, if I, a, a, a very, very reasonably priced print version for students that want it, um, but that otherwise I can do an online version of the text and I can supplement that with ZTC materials so that students are not having to purchase an expensive edition of something that could easily be gotten for free or practically free. Um, and then I also wanted to show the text, the sorry, the book link text that I'm using this uh, semester. And uh, the reason that I wanted to show this is because this is another resource. So um, 
I have used this for several different publications. Um, you can see the licensing, the usage licensing is clearly displayed. So if you have any questions about that, you see it immediately. Um, but the Internet Archive has all sorts of different things. So if you're looking for video, audio clips, looking for different books, uh, they have a lot of resources that are here and all of the licensing information is displayed on the title card so that you know if the, um, how you're able to use that text in your course. And so I had um, heard about this book at a conference. It was recommended to us. And, um, you know, I was able to immediately find this free uh, copy and I started reading through it and it turns out that Dr. Edwards, who is a professor emeritus from uh, Berkeley, he attended Fresno City College. He has a whole chapter about it in his book. And so it really was a, a no brainer for me to replace the text that I was using um, with this book. I read it over a break. Um, and I was like, yes, this is, this is awesome. And it's not gonna cost my students anything extra. And so I was able to bring this text into the class. It's been an excellent text for us. Um, and, you know, again, my students are not spending a dime on materials for my course. Um, and the other thing that I like about both of these resources is that they are available online. So if a student is using um, a reader, then they're able to read online. And then they're also available to download. So if a student doesn't have the ability to stay online for long periods of time due to connectivity, uh, data usage, whatever those limitations might be, then we are, you are able to download it and, um, and use these offline. So they do have that component as well. So the last thing um, in terms of improvements, I'm gonna go back and I'm going to show you um, right now, this first unit, uh, unit one is all open articles on the web, right? And um, what I'm actually gonna be doing in unit three this semester is I'm going to be asking my students, I'm gonna teach them a little bit about Creative Commons licensing. I'm gonna teach them a little bit about OER. And then I'm going to ask them to help me replace the reading materials for this unit um, with materials that are newer since this is an ongoing topic and also um, that are openly licensed so that we can use them uh, to do some different things with for our class activities. And I'm hoping to create a process in the class where the supplementary readings that we're doing are selected and vetted by the students and then um, reviewed and appraised by the students in an ongoing um, setup so that each semester the students can let me know what's working for them and what's not, right? Like they can upvote and down downvote the different supplemental materials, and we can use those to decide how we go moving forward. I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to David. Okay, I can't find the stop share either. Where is it? Where was it? There it is. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is David Yang. I am a math instructor at uh, Fresno City College. And um, just a little bit of background about uh, my experience with OER is I actually, um, uh, I well, as teaching at uh, Fresno City College was my first, you know, full time uh, position uh, at a at a college where where the instructor had freedom to to choose what textbooks they could use. Um, previously, I taught at high school, so high schools were kind of basically given the textbooks. And then when I was an adjunct, I kind of felt was under the, you know, whatever book the my dean gave me to use or the department tree gave me to use. So I didn't really know I had a choice. Um, and that's kind of how I started my career at Frozen Cities. I was just kind of using the books that everybody else was using, uh, similar to like Nick's experience earlier, right? And um, and then I I I came across a um, 
a conference, um, a math conference called CMC Cube. Um, it's, it's a California Community College's uh, math uh, conference, and um, and somebody brought up, you know, OER, and I have never heard that term before. But uh, I was listening to the presentation, and I came away. I was like, wow, like you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that's free. But then it also got me thinking, like you know, math hasn't changed in like how many hundreds of years, right? Why do you need a new textbook to, to show you the same kind of concepts that have been uh, around forever? Um, and then and then I started thinking even more like, wait, but our students don't really even use the textbooks because um, in, in math, a big shift has been uh, moving from um, homework that is done by hand to a lot of like online based homework where students are given immediate feedback, which I really love because um, students don't have to wait for you to grade the homework to get feedback. They can see their answers correct or not right away. And there's a lot of other resources that go along with that as well. Um, and we were using that um, in our department and I was using that um, teaching my classes. And, and I, I just figured that, well, I, I actually hadn't even gotten away from buy, having the students be required to buy the book. They were just only required to purchase the online homework um, license which included a digital version of the textbook. So I guess at least they have that and they didn't have to pay, uh, pay for the uh, digital co or, uh, hard copy of the book. And then um, what, this was way back then fall of 2017 when I started uh, using an OER book um, with my classes and, and slowly like I've kind of transitioned all my classes now to, um, to being uh, completely OER. Um, and you know, as I've done that, then I've started to find ways to cut costs like other where, other places too. Like um, previously, we would have like students be required to purchase a sp specific calculator, but now you know the Fresno City College Library has uh, calculators to check out. So I'm kind of like pushing them to go get that. So then okay, that's another cost that takes away. And then um, I started realizing that our Fresno City print shop would basically print anything for us. And so I've been printing booklets for my students. And, and I started printing it actually this last semester and this semester, mainly because of COVID. I'll just show you guys an example. So I got them to print out a, a booklet and it just has like, like notes and examples and stuff like that, um, that students can use to follow along with the video lessons that I created. And so um, what I did for this semester was I, I actually had, um, um, one day where I like parked in the parking lot of Fresno City and I, I met students and handed them their books, you know, like didn't touch anyone. <laughs> so I just handed books over. Um, and then after that, I just like left my books on my office and I just told them, hey, go pick it up when you, if you need it, yeah, if you can go whenever you can go. And so students were able to have that resource. So it's kind of like, just like, you know, making it easier for students to, um, to, to, um, to access the material um, not only just, you know, in terms of textbooks, but then other, other uh, materials that they'll need for, for the class as well. And so that's kind of the, the approach that I've been, I've been taking with this. And, um, and of course, you know, like, as everybody said, has been talking about, you know, one of the big deciding factors was cost. Um, and so um, Sally asked me to create a, um, a cost savings um, um, given her cost savings a couple of semesters ago because she needed it for a grant. And so I have, I've been keeping up with that. And I actually just, you know, earlier this week, I was kind of went back to way back to 2017 um, and kind of like estimated my costs uh, for textbooks and the number of students and so forth. And I computed that I have saved over $120,000 in textbook um, expenses from just my class alone. Uh, my classes alone and so this is starting in fall of 17 and i teach i basically teach you know uh full load um almost overload every semester teach summer so i have a lot of courses and and with our math courses you know textbooks average around 100 dollars each um or if they don't do the textbook they purchase the on the access code um, for the homework it's still like about 100 dollars. so it's still that, that, that number like blew my mind. And so when I first started doing this, I would just always tell the students like, hey, you know, you, you're saving like $100, like go buy something nice for your mom. Or, you know, kind of, I would just like encourage them to like, you know, kind of pay that forward and, and use it towards something that, you know, would make them feel better. Um, and I, I kind of jokingly like buy me something too, but nobody ever bought me anything. So, so I guess they, they figured that I knew I was just joking around. But, um, but then um, in addition to the textbook, as I was kind of like, um, um, explaining about like, you know, in math, we don't really use a textbook 
um, as like the reading material. It's more of like a resource. Um, if we're not using it to do homework, which we're now all online, then what is it for, right? So, um, so it's again, it's just a really, uh, it's really mainly used as a resource now. And so what about the homework? Well, the homework now we're moved to completely online. And so I wanted to um, share with you guys um, what I'm using for homework. I'm gonna share a screen really quick. So, all right, so I had some stuff here, but I'm just gonna skip through some of this because I think a lot of this has been covered already. And so um, there is um, a link, uh, links to some, resources. Um, so like, for example, like these are the sites that I've used like OpenStax, um, Open Textbook, Open Text Bookstore, Merlot, and Open Education Resources. These are sites that I've used. Um, the first two are have, uh, or not the first two, but the, the OpenStax has a lot of math uh, offerings. The Open Text Bookstore has is just completely only math. And then Merlot and Open Ed, they're like more like of everything. And Merlot is kind of like, it compiles a lot of like uh, links together. So it's easier, it's just like a one house. Um, I like OpenStax because it offers a wide range of uh, course offerings for our, for our college. Um, and um, something that I just kind of even became aware of is that um, some of the open tax, OpenStax textbook offers accessible formats in DAISY, which is, um, you know, text to, um, text to voice, and then the BRF, which is Braille. So students can print it. They can like take it to go print in Braille format. So not all textbooks have it, at least, but some of them do have that. And I saw Jackie's, one of Jackie's, is I saw uh, uh, an accessibility um, uh, format for DAISY too. So, you know, that's, that's something really neat that, that we have here that we don't have to wait for publishers to, to give us or uh, wait for our DSPS to then take these textbooks and then like, you know, transfer it into these particular formats. Um, and so we already kind of looked at the, the two different types, right? You can have the book as a, a PDF version or web-based, um, and Nick and uh, Jackie kind of already addressed these, but this is the big thing for me, was that prior to say, prior to um, figuring out that there was an online, even like OER, uh, I found, uh, or after finding out about OER, I also found out that there's also these free online homework managers. Uh, this this one in particular is My Open Math, and it uses uh, it, a lot of these are 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 um, are have classes that have already been created that are, as templates that instructors can take to modify and and adjust to their needs. Based and then a lot of them have like are based to like very specific textbooks. And so like, uh, like if you were like, okay, I like this OpenStax textbook, there's probably a template for a course that's aligned with that textbook. Um, and this, I, I, this was like one of the big selling points for me because now I always felt like, well, if I'm gonna have to switch over, like that's, I think what a lot of instructors feels like, it's gonna take me a lot of time to, to start fresh. Like I have to like, you know, um, change a new textbook, then I have to like reorganize my notes or, or restructure my classes and things like that. Um, but like with the templates, it makes it really easy for you to just, okay, like this is what I already, I have like a shell to start with. And then I can kind of play around with it as opposed to like starting fresh from the ground up. And then there's always, then there's also like tons of questions in their question banks. The question banks are organized by, by topics, by textbooks, by authors, or whatever. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can um, find questions and you can even just search through keywords and you can find like questions to use. Um, a lot of the questions already have like um, video uh, links that help, uh, that show students, um, you know, um, they give students uh, tips or steps on what to do if they get stuck. Um, things like that, which I thought was like really neat. Um, and again, all of this is free, right? So students weren't having to pay for this either. And the other thing I really liked about this was that it actually links directly with Canvas, right? So we can embed, we can embed the assignments into Canvas and students don't actually have to leave Canvas. They go into Canvas, they log in, they don't have to sign in for another account anywhere. They just log straight into Canvas and they start working right away. So from day one, they have their, they have access to the textbook if they wanted to, they have access to the homework. Um, and, and, and so like on the student side, like, okay, there's like a lot of last, that stress has been taken off. Um, and, but on the instructor side, and what ends up happening here is that when you do the, when the students do the homework, the, the grades uh, are, in, are 
um, transferred directly into Canvas in real time. So as, as students complete one problem, the grade gets put into the grade book. So it's like, it's really like convenient for instructors. Um, and then students also, cause then they can go and see like what their current grade is and now have to wait for the instructor to review or upload or transfer the grade from one site to another to Canvas and so forth. Um, and the last thing is, you know, something I've started to do because of you know COVID, us being home, is that I I've been able to use this online homework manager to create assignments that involve my video lessons, and so um, I I make it an assignment. I make it so that like if you can see, I don't know if you guys can see, but down here um, there is a there is a link or sorry there is a um, there is a, a little button at the bottom where you can say you know I watched the video. And press submit, and so you know it's just a, it's just an easy way for them to just say, hey, like confirm that they did. The only thing is that you can't force students to read to watch the whole video. So, so I found some students have just like clicked and gone through. But the really neat thing is that with my open map, you can actually track how much time that they spent on it. So I'll go and I'll follow up, and I'm like, hey, you didn't watch this video. Um, you're not going to get credit for it, so make sure you go back and watch it again. You know, so um, we can I can see how much time they spent on it. Um, you know. Um, how much time they were in the video as opposed to like being like um, like clicking out to a different site and things like that too. Um, and then there's also an option um, which I haven't used for this semester but I've used in the previous semester for what's called queued videos. So if you you can take a video lesson that you a video that you created or or a, uh, a let's say a YouTube video and you can slice it up and you can input questions into each of the different sections so that students can, um, as they're watching the video, they'll be paused, they have to answer that question before they can move on. So I think that's something that um, I'm looking more into doing, uh, especially you know, that's making the students a little bit accountable for this. Um, it's just, it, it takes a lot of work, so <laughs> it didn't happen this semester, but you know, it seems like if we're gonna be in the fall, um, um, online again, that's that that'll be a goal to get that done for that as well. So that's all I have for for this. Um, and, um, and, and, and so there was a question uh, from Nate, sure, uh, regarding your booklet. Uh huh. Yeah, I just wanted to know where it was. Is that like a the book from uh, the OER OpenStax that you use that you just copied over. What 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 was in the actual booklet? Okay, so there are two there are two booklets that I've used. Um, the one I use in um, I, I can I just pull it up. Let me just pull it up. The one I use in um, for for my stats class um, was actually created by another instructor. Her name is Dar Darlene Diaz from Sandy, uh, San Diego Canyon College. And so um, I found her, I found her book and, and then I, I, I emailed her, I asked her if I could use it. And she said it was fine. I, I didn't have any creative comments, like things on it. So that's why I had a, but then I, I kind of played around with it and um, got rid of like just some little things. And, and then um, I just said, you know, I gave her credit, just said I modified it. Um, and, and these are then, this, this is her, her notes and her uh, um, um, uh, examples that that she uses, and so I use this as as um, part of my class. And so when I do the lesson, I, I go through the I go through the notes, I work out the examples, and then um, you know then the students have this to follow along. Um, the other one is the one I made, and the one I made was just a result of all of the notes that I have created over the over the years, basically. And so I just kind of started compiling them together. And so this one's not as pretty. Uh, this one is, uh, you can tell it's like, it's not like math text. It's more like, it's just like out of in word. And so this is the one that I created and and then I use this along with the same thing. So um, I, I, you know, go through the example, go through the, the terms, go work about the examples and so forth. And um, yeah, both of these are, resources that I make available to students so they can they can pick up a, pop, a copy uh, of the hard copy book or they can download the PDF versions um, and then use it on like an iPad or if they want to do something like that. Um, so these are just resources that I've either created or found um, and I'm more than welcome to share with them because I don't feel like any ownership of it. It's just you know things that I've done or things that I found that I, I'm willing to to share with everyone. 
This is awesome. Um, I think it's really cool too to see how you've all incorporated different types of materials, um, whether you're using just like a book that you, a, an entire book that you found on OpenStax and kind of modifying it and adapting it to your own class, but also, you know, putting it directly in Canvas, searching the internet for all kinds of things. It's really awesome. Um, I think Susanna, you had, did you have a question about the booklet as well? I'm trying to scroll through the chat. I did. I was just wondering when we publish, when we, um, you know, copy things in the production center, we have to put our, I guess, our department code. So that's what I want to know. Was there a, a, a limit or a cost limit? But Sally answered the question on that, I think, in her yeah, response. Yeah, I, I have never heard of any limits. Um, I have heard of, you know, some instructors copying crazy amounts, like, for example, Marianne, you know, just, I mean, she does her entire, one of her classes she just copies the entire book uh, chapter by chapter. And she just, she just hands out packets like every couple of weeks for every student. And, you know, she teaches some large classes. And so, uh, so far <laughs> they haven't complained or they haven't said anything. Um, so I say, just, you know, do it until they complain. Yeah, I, I was under the same boat too. I was scared to print, so I, I printed like three copies first, just to kind of like see if it would come through. And, Cause I didn't know how the production um, was gonna work during COVID too. So I just printed a couple of copies just to kind of see what it turned out. I didn't get any like feedback or anything. They just, and then, so then I just amped it up and I just printed like 120 copies <laughs> and, and, and it came in a big old box and that was it. Like there was nothing, no no email saying you printed a lot. The And the reason was cause um, our dean has always stressed use the copy use the copy center because whenever you use our when we use the copy machine in the, the division office that's when it costs money because then she's like I think she said it costs 10 cents per page or something like that and so for us like it was always a push to go to the copy center and um, yeah there's never been any uh, pushback they must be operating those at a that way fraction too. right now so I mean live it up copy everything right now right I mean the tutorial center, when we were face to face, all of our handouts are through production. And we've never been told there's a cap on it or anything. We just, so you know, when you come up to the center, we have our rounds that you just grab whatever you want out of there for the students. And we encourage them actually to compile all the, all those materials so that they can use them at home as well. Um, and now we have the online handouts so they can access them you know at will but yeah never never I didn't even find out about that until I started working at the WRC though as an instructor I didn't realize I could go to production and have all stuff made like it was so great you know but no no one's ever said no what they have said is stop using the copier the copy machine <laughs> that was me Shoshana my program uses way too much Sorry. You guys do. I know. Yeah. ETC was the the worst um, with that. So, and I still haven't been told. Oh, I've been told to slow down, um, but not stop. Even though now we're online, so they they got lucky. But I'm waiting to go back and use it again. So use it before we do. <laughs> yeah. Do you have you tr uh, archived any of that stuff so that you have digital versions of it now? Um, yeah, that's what I've done too. Yeah, so we are over the time that I that we thought. Um, so I think, um, does anybody have any more questions relevant to this? All right, I'm stopping the recording. <laughs>